Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage SVP Content and Services, Yoon Lee. Hello everyone, I'm Yoon Lee. I run Samsung's Content and Services division and I'm your host today. Welcome to the day two spotlight session at SDC. Before I begin, I'd like to make a small announcement. Today, we meet as engineers, as innovators, and as people to imagine a better future. But I want to start today by acknowledging the present. Last night, in Southern California, in Thousand Oaks, we witnessed another incident of senseless violence. It's a moment for us to mourn the lives lost, to grieve with their families. So let's have a moment of silence. Let's be with the survivors in spirit as we recommit ourselves to imagining the brighter future, and that's the better world. OK, the show must go on, so we're coming back to our scheduled event. We had quite a few exciting announcements yesterday. The all-new Bixby, smart things becoming the most complete open IoT platform in the world. And how about One UI? Pretty awesome, right? <laughs> and of course, don't forget the all-new foldable screen. <laughs> Pretty exciting stuff. We've got even more excitement for you today. Uh, with a diverse group of speakers who are doing some great work in many fields. They're the best in the business, and we're proud to have them here. Today, they will be talking about the future of gaming, digital pen technology, and personalized AI. So before we begin, I want to continue on with a tradition we started last year at SDC, and that is asking a couple of trivia questions for prizes. So I have two questions. Um, the prizes are Galaxy Watch, one black, one gold. And here we go. Can we, here we go. First question. Most people have played, or at the very least, heard of a gaming company called Atari, right? OK. So, who knows what Atari means? Raise your hands for the black, nice Samsung watch. Who was the first one? A gentleman over there. Oh, he passed. He passed. Go. Uh, any better answers? There's, there's a. Pardon me. Checkmate. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Thank you. So, uh, gold or black watch? Black watch, OK. It means that you've hit your target or opponent successfully through a dynamic strategy, which is fitting for such an iconic company. It's actually coming from the game of Go. To give you a little bit more background, Atari was founded in 1972. It's actually a Sunnyvale, California company. And its first game was Pong, which averaged $400 a week in sales for its, its initial test run. So talking about success. All right, second question for, he got the black one, so second question for the gold Samsung watch. OK, I feel like someone knows this. Machine learning AI is all the rage in tech scene right now, and certainly no exception at this year's SDC. With that said, does anyone know who, in, who invented the term AI? First, John McCarthy, wow. Brilliant, brilliant. OK, so. Um, we use AI so much these days, we feel like it was coined recently, but the truth is it was coined in actually 1955, 63 years ago, by John McCarthy in a proposal for a research project. 
So he later on uh, organized a conference in 1956 called the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence, or AI. And then soon the, the research center was popping up at universities like Carnegie Mellon and MIT and so on. So um, that was when it happened. There's a, dis dis there's a dispute between, is it 1955 or 1956? So we instead decided to ask a more difficult question, who invented it, and that gentleman just nailed it. Congratulations. What else happened in 1955? Disneyland opened in July, and McDonald's started in 1955. The average gas price was actually 25 cents, and the minimum wage was $1. Some interesting facts. OK, enough trivia for now. We have more chances to win Galaxy watches and other price, prize. Um, at the end of the spotlight session. So for excitement, I'm not going to reveal what it is, so sit tight. And we're going to start. Are you ready to start? OK, let's get started. This is supposed to be a fun session. It is not a scripted, static session. It's going to be a fun session. We're going to create a party for you guys today. So stay tight, stand up, make noises. The more applause you do, the better for the, uh, the participants up here, OK? So without further ado, please welcome Vice President, Service Manage Group, Thomas Coe. Man, a lot of pressure. I have to party on. Come on. Hello, San Francisco, and how are you? And welcome to the second day of Samsung Developer Conference. Today, and we are very excited to talk about Samsung gaming for the first time. And I am very genuinely excited because this is one of the most exciting programs at Samsung. And you know why? Because we have been working the foundations of this gaming strategy since 2015. Now, but before gaming, let me talk about a little bit more about Samsung and who we are. I think that this is a very important context because I will help you to understand our gaming strategy. So here we go. So I work in the head office of Samsung Electronics. It's called Suwon, South Korea. Maybe this becomes a trivia question later on. It is about 35 kilometers south of the famous from the song Gangnam Style. It's Gangnam, right? And this place is called Samsung Digital City. And it's literally a small city with a football field, baseball fields, and pizza area, and pretzel locations, and ice creams. I mean, this is a big place. But this is where all the magic has been designed, researched, and produced in the last 50 plus years. Being there myself the last three years taught me very important two things about Samsung. First, love for technology. For Samsung, technology is our nickname, and engineering is our middle name. Technical innovations is respected, admired, and praised. All of our engineers may not be fluent in English, but they can certainly speak your language. C++ in Java, Scala, you name it. We speak fluently. Second, people. I call Samsung engineers Passionate problem solvers. There is literally nothing impossible for these guys. If they cannot solve it with the software, they go to hardware design and they go to hardware components and they make things possible. You saw a great example from yesterday, foldable phone. We take great pride in solving the most difficult engineering problems with the technology. So two things I mentioned, technology and people. But that's how we approach to the game industry. Now let me take it back where the story began in 2015. With our CEO, DJ Ko, who was a CTO back then, he saw a problem with a high fidelity graphical rendering for mobile phones. And it was challenging to create something of the same quality that you see from consoles and PC games. So he decided to adapt a technology called Vulkan API for Galaxy phones, and reached out to Tim Sweeney of Epic Games, who is known as 
maker of Fortnite. And together, they announced Vercon API solutions at S7 on in 2016. But not only adopting a technology to really to, to truly make it happen, he launched a special task force as known as Game Dev. He recruited a passionate gamers, but at the same time, the best engineers from all over the world. To do what? To make the best game experience in Galaxy. So today, we have over 50 partners that we are collaborating with actively, and we are very happy to launch several high-fidelity games on the market. Let me actually talk about a few of them. First, Vainglory by Super Evil Mega Corps. Final Fantasy XV, Pocket Edition by Square Enix. Honor of Kings, known as Wang Da Yong Yo by Tencent Games. Black Desert by Porobis. And the last, but not least, Fortnite by Epic Games. Now in 2018, there are an estimated 2.1 billion mobile gamers around the world. 56% of them, we heard that they play games, and it's 10 times a week. But the Galaxy smartphone is by far the world's largest platform for Android games. Having the most active devices in the market, Samsung is in a very unique position to shape the future of mobile games. And our aim is very simple. Create the most immersive and unique differentiated experiences for gamers across the world. To turn this vision into reality, we are taking baby steps to provide the best support for the game developers and your, uh, the gaming industry. In the coming year, Galaxy Game Dev will expand to include even more cutting-edge tools like GPU Watch. GPU Watch can deliver better insight to game developers so that they can optimize their games easier and more efficiently. Also, Samsung's own game SDK we also share very clear device status information to let the game developers and contents to tune its performance adaptively per devices. In 2019, also to help all the gaming partners to easily deliver the latest games to their customers, we will launch the brand new Galaxy Store. This will become the only store in the Galaxy ecosystems for all the digital contents, not just games, but all of applications and themes and Galaxy Watch designs and fonts and more and many more. Also, the single seller portal for all the developers will be offered with advanced data analytics and dashboard and a better settlement system. We will continue to innovate and simplify the steps for Galaxy users to find the new games for Galaxy phones and provide more exclusive benefits. We promise you that Samsung will pursue the best gaming experience with all of you. And together, let's become not just a game developer, but become a game changer. Can we get applause? <laughs> all right. Yay. Well, there are several technology companies that shape the new levels of gaming experiences, something that you have not yet witnessed. One of the companies who has been known as an innovator in this game industry is none other than Microsoft. And their Xbox division is ready to take on the world with the project xCloud. There's two billion gamers in the world. Some of them have a PC, some of them have a console, some of them have a smartphone, some of them have all three. What if everybody in the world could play Halo? What if everybody in the world could play Red Dead Redemption? Everybody in the world could play the games. What would we have to do in order to make that possible? In order to do that, we believe we need to build a game streaming service. We see game streaming as a great technology, giving you access to the games that you want to play on the device that you want to play them on. Being able to compute in the cloud and then stream to whatever device I am on, allow me to play with anybody, that's powerful. 
But when you think about any other form of media, the idea that it's locked to one device is, is just totally absent. I want to be the center of my world, um, and I want the devices around me and the services around me to be available wherever I want them to be. What does it mean to completely change the paradigm of how we play? The first thing people say is, you're crazy, you can't build a service like that. What about latency? What about the level of detail? What about the richness of the game? Is my experience going to get degraded? We are a gaming company with content and community, and we happen to also have a great, strong first-party cloud in Azure. It makes us uniquely positioned here. So how real is it? The first time I played Forza on my Android phone, it was just amazing. You're playing your favorite game and it's streaming. You'll be able to play with an Xbox One controller connected via Bluetooth. And if you don't have a controller, you'll be able to play with our touch input controls. I'm a huge console gamer, but now when I'm done with the console or my son walks into the room and he wants to play something else, I don't ever have to stop gaming because I'll be able to game the games that I love on every device that I own. As we think about this next step for us, the idea of putting the gamer at the center is critical to how we goal ourselves in the gaming team and the Xbox team. We love the device that we build, our, our Xbox consoles. We want those to be world-class, the best place to play. Consoles are still going to be a flagship experience. You know, you're going to have that immersive, high-fidelity experience with your amazing sound systems. It's all right there. But we know not everybody on the planet is going to go buy a gaming console. It's actually about choice for you. It's amazing for traditional console players because it gives them another place to play. But what's incredible is for the people who haven't been introduced to this type of gaming. People who've never seen a franchise like Halo or never seen a franchise like Gears, it's pretty amazing. We have it up and running today. And when we have it just right, we're going to scale it out in an epic way and deliver it to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Head of Global Gaming Partnerships and Development, Microsoft Xbox, Sarah Bond. Pretty awesome, right? There are 8 billion people on the planet. 4 billion of them are connected, and 2 billion of them are gamers. Gaming is a global phenomenon and the media form of the future. But at Xbox, we look at it and we see that gaming is held back by an antiquated problem. You know, as a leadership, leadership team, we sat around and we said, it shouldn't be that the device that you're on determines who, what, and where you can play. So we decided to shape a future where gaming is completely unconstrained. A future where a gamer can play on any game they want, on any device, no matter where they are. A future where people can connect and share experiences. So a boy in Mumbai playing on his mobile phone can play alongside a PC gamer in Sao Paulo. A future where a developer, where you, can build a single version of your game and reach billions of players with no worry of GPU size, phone memory, or experience degradation. And we decided we're going to build that future. We're going to do what Spotify did to music, what Netflix did for video. We want to make games available anywhere, on any screen, instantly. The thing is, is that today, video and music streaming are commonplace. And we don't know, we have all the answers there. But the rules of game streaming are being written right now. And so we decided we're going to take the 40 years experience we have in gaming, our deep content portfolio, our extensive community of Xbox Live users, and we're going to combine that with Microsoft's global cloud infrastructure that spans 54 regions around the globe. And we're going to take those things and be laser focused about solving the multifaceted and complex challenges to ensure that we can bring every digitally connected person on the planet a game streaming experience.
Together, we are going to create a future where the hundreds of millions of people who are holding a Samsung device are also holding the gateway to a high-powered gaming experience. Okay, I'm ready for the next step. All right, continuing on, we are so excited to have these two amazing panelists today. Can you guess who they are? First, Tim Sweeney, the CEO and president of Epic Games. He is. He is a creator and one of the most successful games serving over 200 million users worldwide in 2018 called Fortnite. It truly produced a cross-platform gaming experiences across Microsoft, Xbox, Sony, PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, PC, and mobile phones. I'm sure many of you have seen the Fortnite dance challenge, right? I've been bucked by your sons and daughters and nephews and nieces to get the Galaxy skin, right? The Note 9 for Tavis 4. But also, Epic has been known for their best game engine called Unreal and provides a superior game development environment. Tim is passionate about games, and like all of you, He's proud to be a game developer. Now, second, we have John Hankey, CEO of Niantic. No one knew. No one knew what AR meant, and no one knew what the world could be transformed into a game board until we saw Pokemon Go. John is a creator and one of the first and best AR games in the world, including Pokemon Go and its predecessor, Ingress, which continues to delight hundreds of millions of users worldwide and have caused everyone to go around and collecting Pokemon by throwing monster balls and feeding berries. He recently announced the availability of Niantic real-world AR platform to open up AR game development to all the developers, something Samsung is super excited about, and we are thrilled to partner with Niantic on the ongoing development of the platform. So without further ado, please welcome John Enke and Tim Sweeney. Tim, oh, thank you. Thank you. John, thank you. Good morning. Thank you very, very much for coming to the stage. Hey, audience, can we get all the applause for these two gentlemen? Before I begin, I had to take a selfie in the backstage because, man, it's a historic moment for me. <laughs> all right. It's an honor for us, not just Samsung, but all the game developers in the audience today. Hey, all the game developers, can you raise your hand? All right. Woo! All right, we are shy people. Anyway. We'll start by going through what you both have done, because I think it's such an iconic thing that you guys have done together. First, Tim, you have been a game developer for more than two decades and created probably one of the best game engines called Unreal, where so many developers get their benefit from. Can you tell me what was your motivations and what was the reason to why you created the engine? Well, you know, in the early days, we just set out to make a game, Unreal. Um, I was building uh, the 3D graphics and editor technology, and other folks were building the content levels. Um, and uh, we didn't actually even know we had an engine until our first customer called, them up, called us up and uh, asked if they could license our engine. We were like, <laughs> engine? What? Oh, oh, right, that engine. Yeah, it's very expensive. <laughs> so that's how Unreal began. How much was the engine? Uh, well, let's see, uh, you could pay us a quarter million dollars up front, um, oh. and uh, that would get you uh, a license to Unreal back in uh, 1996. Wow, and that was the beginning of Unreal. Yeah, that's right. Um, but now there are millions of developers using uh, Unreal, and millions of developers using Unity and other engines, and uh, the great game in industry is greatly benefiting from access to these tools developed by hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, we, I mean, we can't really talk about Epic Games without talking about Fortnite. <laughs> well, the latest figure says over 200 million users worldwide are enjoying your game right now. But one thing that people haven't really noticed is that it's a cross-platform game. 
Can you tell me what is cross-platform game and what were the th success factors for Fortnite? Well, you know, it's, it's the players who've chosen to make uh, Fortnite successful. Um, I think a key to that is the fact that you can play on any device. Um, you can play on a smartphone, you can play on a console or a PC. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a game that's open to everybody, but you can also play across all devices with your friends on other devices. And it's uh, the first major game that's uh, been completely unlocked across all of the platforms. And that means that Fortnite has taken on a lot of the characteristics of a social network. A lot of uh, kids hang out in Fortnite uh, you know, in the evening just to chat with their friends. And the Battle Royale experience is only part of it. Really what they're doing is they're hanging out with their friends and they're having a good time. Mm. Um, I think that's a great opportunity for all other games to move in that direction. Mm. How many of you guys play Fortnite? Can, can I see your hands? Oh, don't be shy. <laughs> all right. How about, how many of you guys are familiar with the dance challenge? Any one of you or want to volunteer to come upstairs? And... <laughs> well, it's a cultural phenomenon. But Fortnite is a game of shooting and battle royale. And now, all of a sudden, everybody's just crazy about this dance challenge. Did you plan this? I mean, what did you make of, it, of this? Well, you know, uh, throughout the seven long years of developing Fortnite, um, we just thought we were building a, a fun game with some interesting mechanics and a neat art style. Um, we hadn't imagined the effect it would have on the game industry. Um, and we had many technological goals uh, with Fortnite and the Unreal Engine. Um, I have to admit, um, making dancing cool again among kids was not one of the goals. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> I have to ask you, uh, can you dance, Fortnite dance? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, all right. Come on, Tex. Right. <laughs> you know, hey, maybe... Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think if you guys are really one, I think he may dance a couple moves here on the stage. <laughs> all right, let's, let's see. All right, John. Well, not that many people, I'm not sure whether you know or not, but you started this journey not as a game developer, but as a map guy. I mean, have you got, do you guys know John? He was the one who started Google Earth and Google Maps, and now extending to the maps to Pokemon Go. So, I mean, this journey is, is so fascinating. What was your motivation to go from maps and to the game? Well, I just got the chance to put together two things that I love. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I fell in love with games when I got my first computer and started programming to make my own games. And I fell in love with maps, perusing back issues of National Geographic. Uh, <laughs> and thankfully, as an adult, I've gotten to um, work in both of those areas. Um, after we sort of grew maps and Earth to kind of a mature point, I was looking for something new to do. And this idea of taking a map and taking the world and turning it into a game was just kind of an irresistible idea. Um, and as a parent, I was also looking for stuff that I could enjoy together with my kids, mm -hmm. that we could do outside. And it occurred to me that, you know, g games, as amazing as they are, in the past, they were kind of tied to the wall because you had to plug a device in and then maybe you had to connect to the internet. But um, obviously with mobile, uh, that's not true anymore. So um, I thought it'd be really fun to think about, well, what kind of a game could not only be untethered that you could take out in the world, but would be really native to that experience, not something moving it just from a, you know, a, a console or, or desktop experience out into the world, but... If you're just going to make a game from scratch that was meant to be played outside with people together, what would it be? And so, yeah, we started working on stuff. Well, I have to ask you too. How many of you guys play Pokemon Go? Come on. Don't be shy. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Well, Pokemon Go, you know that it's a global hit. I mean, it's, it's more than 200 million users too, worldwide. When AR was not even a fashion, nobody knew what AR meant. And Pokemon Go suddenly just storm the world and with a, everybody's going for this Pokemon. Did you have this plan all along? <laughs> Was this your part of the grand vision to conquer the world? Well, I saw a lot of developers out there, like who feels like you got everything exactly right with V1 of your product? Raise your hand. <laughs> I don't see many hands raised. So. You know, Pokemon Go was an overnight, you know, hit that was four years in the making, five years in the making in that we built a game, Ingress, which came before it. And that's where we got to experiment with what it means to make a game that's meant to be played outside together. Um, and we learned a ton from that. We learned that people really liked an incentive to go to a new part of town and see something they hadn't seen before. 
uh, we learned that a lot of people really like the little, I, I like to say nudge, just to get a little bit more walking in, a little bit more exercise in every day, even though we didn't have that in mind when we made the product. And the big learning was that people really responded to a game that gave them something to do together with their friends in the real world, like going out to a movie or going out to eat. This was like a new thing that people could do together. And they really loved the ability to meet new people through the product as a sort of social icebreaker. Um, so that was all stuff that we, we learned just by studying how people played Ingress. And we tried our best to incorporate that into Pokemon Go. And I think, you know, to the extent that people have been enjoying that game, it's really, you know, the game is enabling these experiences of exercise, being out in the world and seeing new places, and importantly, doing it together with other people, which is something Tim alluded to. Um, we are social beings, and doing stuff together um, is ultimately the most enjoyable kind of thing that you can do. So I think, you know, that's, that's at the heart of well, our mission. I mean, you mentioned something very, very intriguing, which also I heard the stories from you, Ted. There are people playing Pokemon Go and sharing the stories like they overcame depression. Uh, now they are getting closer to their kids, right? And ever before, they're losing weight and getting healthier life. I mean, this is uh, unheard of from any of the games I, I, at least I, I know. Um, what do you feel about this? I mean, it seems like this, there was some grand vision that you had. Well, I think it's great. I feel like, um, I mean, tech has been, it's been an amazing journey in my adult life. You know, it's been the journey from the personal computer, the Apple II era, to where we are today in the smartphone era. And I kind of feel like we're emerging from the dark ages. Uh, in the sense that, for a long time, tech was able to do so much for us, entertain us, give us knowledge and information, but it demanded that we conform ourselves to the technology. We had to sit hunched in front of a computer terminal in order to get the benefits from technology. And we've reached this point in evolution for where all of a sudden we've broken free of that tether uh, through mobility and through high-performance mobile networks. And so all that goodness that um, has been incubating all of that time is now available in a way that isn't, doesn't have the burden of being tethered to a computer and to the wall. And uh, so it's a really exciting time now to think about um, how can we build products that really live in that world and fully take advantage of this era where the computer is with us all the time as part of our lives all the time. What kinds of products can we build that um, are native to that and are kind of interwoven with everything that we do? Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's a really exciting time. Can we get a big applause? Well, it's, it's really fascinating to learn from these two gentlemen who really changed how we play the game. Now, let's turn our focus on mobile gaming because, you know, uh, we are here at SDC, we are about mobile phone. So mobile gaming, where we saw the biggest growth in the last several years, now uh, I think that the, uh, probably the mobile is becoming de facto the biggest gaming device, right? Maybe more popular than consoles and PCs or maybe both of them combined. Now, the question is for both of you. Um, what do you think of the mobile phone as a gaming device? Is, is there anything that you are expecting more from? Or is there anything that you wish to you know, have a mobile phone to actually do better? Any particular things that you think? Maybe start from Tim? Sure. You know, the amazing thing that's happened with mobile gaming is it's brought more than 2 billion people into gaming um, for the first time. You know, consoles were the historic start of the industry. Um, they brought in the first 100 or 200 million, but uh, the number of people who are now gamers because of, of smartphones is unbelievable and unprecedented in all history. Um, and it's not only, uh, you know, it's not only guys. There are girls and people of all ages um, engaging in gaming of all types. Uh, so it's really widened the audience hugely, and it's made possible, you know, this new generation of games like Pokemon Go, which or, you know, Fortnite, which only works because of the huge number of people playing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, John? Yeah, I mean, for me, the most exciting thing is the input side of the equation. So if you think of the mobile phone, you know, there's input and output, and the output is what we see or hear, the screen. It's important, um, but what's new about mobile is that you have all this great input to work with. Um, video games tradition, we had the keyboard or the mouse or a controller, but now we've got the camera, we've got audio, we've got location, we've got intelligence to try to do something with that. Um, so that's the part that 
I think we've only just begun to tap into what can we do with the phone, understanding the environment and reacting to what's in it. Um, if you look at, you know, as, and many of you are developers, advances in computer vision and through the camera, just to understanding what's in the world and then m melding your game to that environment or responding to that environment. It's kind of uncharted territory. So the input side, the development of those sensors, and the sensors are getting better all the time. Um, I'm excited because that means we can all make new experiences, novel experiences that haven't existed before. So really excited to see what we can do and see what you guys can do with that. Great, great. Let me actually take off my fat hat because uh, I saw the picture and it didn't look that good. So, <laughs> all right. All right, let's turn our eyes now, not just what you just did, but now in the future, right? I'm sure you are preparing something for the future of gaming. I mean, as you have done with years and years with the technology advancements and innovations that you guys have done, what, are, what is upcoming? Tim? Well, you know, with Fortnite, there's something new every week. Um, so uh, uh, a lot of our real long-term planning goes into the Unreal Engine and the set of features we can provide. And the really exciting thing that's coming now is it's the set of possibilities enabled by augmented reality. Um, mm -hmm the way that it's using really advanced input and output technology to put us together in a virtual environment. And I think as we combine augmented reality with social experiences, putting groups of people together in a social environment that's 3D, that's going to be incredibly exciting. Mm. Um, you know, today uh, we're doing it uh, with smartphones and tablets, but in the future hopefully we'll have some science fiction level hardware that we can put on our heads and experience it seamless combination of the real world and the virtual world all together, and that's mm -hmm. going to revolutionize the game industry for all of us. Okay. Any new exciting dance coming up in Fortnite? <laughs> Any new dance as well? There's a new one every few weeks. Well, so, can I send yeah. you my video clip of dance, and can you put it onto the game? Uh, yeah, that's negotiable. All right. <laughs> Come on, it's coming in 2019. John, what, what are you planning? Well. I imagine some people out there probably saw the Pokemon Go trailer that came out actually before the game. Um, and a lot of what we're working on is really making what's in the trailer possible. You know, that was really our imagination of what an AR game could ultimately be. Um, and so we're hard at work on synchronized, stateful, massively multiplayer AR experiences so that we can encounter the Mewtwo in Times Square and live out that fantasy of having a gaming experience that's high performance in real time where the AR is convincing and really deeply embedded in reality. Um, we showed some of that with our Project Neon demo last summer and that tech uh, is part of what's going into the Niantic platform. The other super exciting area for me, and it's a newer one for me, is uh, deep learning um, as applied to AR and gaming. And we also showed some work that we've done in that area, which solves a really hard problem in AR, which is occlusion, understanding like where things are in the scene and where to hide things behind existing real world objects. Uh, and we showed a deep learning based approach to that, which is also uh, part of our platform. Um, so that area of computer science is evolving incredibly quickly and is making things possible. It's making it possible to solve problems that in the past were or can only be solved through very cumbersome uh, techniques. So I think there's much to be gained there in um, AR, recognizing objects, understanding their position in space um, through that technique. On the game design side, um, I'm really excited about this idea as a game, not as a session, but as something that's part of your life, like all the time. So we rolled out a feature called Adventure Sync recently, which is sort of a baby step in that direction. It syncs with your step counter uh, with uh, your health or fit application on your device. And uh, it lets all of that activity count towards your Pokemon Go egg hatching and other progress in the game. Um, that idea that a game can be something that you play for 10 minutes, then you go to work or jump on the bus, maybe you have a short session on the bus, maybe you take a, a break from work for a few minutes, and you do different things in the game, but it's always there. It's always going on in the background. Other people are doing things. So it becomes this alternative reality that's there that you peek into. And maybe you peek into it through your phone, maybe you peek into it through a widescreen TV at home, maybe you can log into it through a game console, and I think the work that Tim has done to make his game span all the different devices is really interesting. Um, so that notion of game as part of, our, a part of the fabric of our lives is, I think, exciting. And that's really a thinking challenge about how we design these things. And also, I heard very exciting new titles coming up. It's called something related to 
Harry and Potter. We're, we're really excited about Harry Potter Wizards Unite. Um, and that's, all, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we cannot say more, right? You have to kill me if you want me to say something. <laughs> all right. Now, I got two questions and for both of you. Number one, I mean, thank you very much for trusting Samsung and really working together with us. Um, what is your ask for Samsung to create for you? Tim? Well, you know, uh, we're really grateful for the level of quality of all of the Samsung hardware that's released, uh, for the quality of the drivers uh, that enable us to ship really high-end great games with great graphics, um, and for the updates, uh, they're constantly released to keep existing devices uh, up with the state of the art. Uh, we'd love to see continued investment in this um, and continue to drive the hardware towards a higher and higher levels so that uh, the, you know, the idea of a gaming console that fits in your pocket can continue to evolve and to bring world-class gaming to billions of people. All right. John? Well, I mean, the progress that's been made already to see Fortnite running on a Samsung mobile device with the Fidelity is incredible. So it's already achieved a sort of mind-blowing state. Um, I'm really interested in working with you all to optimize um, AR experiences, uh, to take advantage of new sensors and better sensors that are becoming available in the devices to make more interesting kinds of gameplay and to make AR, the core AR experience better. I'm um, really excited um, to look forward when phones may include things like neural processing uh, co-processors uh, to let some of the vision and deep learning things that I alluded to earlier work faster and better uh, in real time on mobile devices. So being able to collaborate and take, get the most out of what you guys are building and maybe like nudge you guys in certain directions has been invaluable on the, on the phone side. On the network side, you know, there's an equally interesting opportunity for us, which is in the uh, edge computing and 5G area. So for our kind of real world games, we, you know, we, are, we regularly gather hundreds of thousands of people together for gaming experiences taking full advantage of the edge computing architecture to do high performance AR, to do stateful shared AR um, is super exciting because that tech makes it a lot easier. The potential lower latencies for 5G, some of the positioning technologies there and moving things out to the edge are all really, really interesting technically. And so, you know, Samsung's a really unique company in that you guys are pushing state of the art on the client and pushing state of the art on the infrastructure. Uh, we really value the chance to collaborate with you on those things. All right. I mean, there are many uh, Samsung engineering VPs out here. I think they all took a note of, uh, yes, 5G, <laughs> antennas, battery, <laughs> GPU. All right. We're good. We're going to make for you, right? OK, now, I mean, the, really the fact that I really appreciate working with both of you is that you are really, really developer-centric. You really embrace yourself as a game developer, and you really try to do good things for the developer community. What do you have to say, any particular message that you want to say to the developer audience here today? Tim? Sure, you know, I think a lesson that can be learned from both Pokemon Go and Fortnite, uh, which are among the most successful mobile games ever, is that games that connect people together socially are, you know, the next generation of entertainment, and they're inherently uh, longer lasting and more engaging um, than games that people only can play alone. And so I think there are a lot of very interesting lessons to learn from that and new types of games that can be explored uh, in the realm of socially connecting people together to engage in really exciting experiences together. Mm -hmm. I, I would just second that. Um, I think the advent of Fortnite on the mobile phone is put a fresh you know, emphasis on building like really, really fun mobile experiences. Uh, I think, you know, there are some, some mobile games may have uh, lost their way a little bit in the sort of free-to-play and, and lost a little bit of emphasis on fun. So we try to, you know, that's core of our mission at Niantic, and I think Fortnite's a great example of that. Um, you know, I would love for the game devs here to build games that I want to play. Uh, and, you know, for me, that's new experiences that take, uh, that take the phone and do things with it that people have never done before in games. So we're really excited to be putting our platform out there to put all of the tools and techniques that we've been building for our own games to put it in the hands of folks like you because I know that you have ideas and uh, creative uh, instincts that go beyond anything that we've imagined. And I think in this world of AR and real world and mobile, it's so new and there's so much to be invented. 
uh, so many creative ways that that can be applied that no one's done before. Uh, I'm just really excited to see what people are going to do with that over the next decade. Wow, wow, that's a very powerful world. Well, let me actually share one thing. I'm a huge fan of Harry Potter, right? And a huge fan of, therefore, J.K. Rowling. And she once said this. Shall we have a quote? We do not need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. We are living in the 21st century, enjoying all the amazing experiences through these wonderful games that this gentleman has created because of they had the power to imagine, the courage to go for it, and the brilliance to write one more line of code. I have not personally seen any wizards with a magical power to change the world, but I have seen these two gentlemen carrying all the power they need inside themselves already, and the world is already changing because of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Sweeney and John Henke. Thank you very much. Thank you. R&D Group, Sally Jiang. Oh, hello everyone. It's so exciting to be at SDC 18 with you. Like you promised at the Galaxy Note 9 Unpack back in August, I'm here with great news that the Aspen Remote SDK is now available at developer.samsung.com for integration with your apps. <laughs> okay, you can use the Aspen Remote Control feature to provide a unique experience to your apps. The best part is that it's very easy to code it. Make sure to visit our Aspen Remote booth and code lab after this session and my team, here's my team. Hi. <laughs> and my team will be at the Open Theater from 1.30 today to show you how. From cameras to games, I'll be anticipating creative ways the S Pen with remote control is integrated into your services. And this is just the beginning of an exciting transformation for S Pen. Starting from a simple writing tool, it is now a remote control. Aren't you curious to know what else digital pens can do in the future? I am. Let's invite our long-term Aspen partner, Wacom CEO Nobu Ide, for his ideas on how stylus will be in the age of intelligence. Please welcome Nobu Ide. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Nobu, CEO of Wacom, flying from Tokyo, actually. I'm so excited to join Samsung Development Center and to introduce you to Wacom's visions of Universal Inc. Uh, but first, uh, let, me Samsung, let, let me thank you, Samsung, for our par partnership, uh, bringing more than 100 million Galaxy Note pen to demanding customers all using Wacom's leading edge digital pen and ink technologies. Thank you. <laughs> Wacom has served the creative industry since our founding 35 years ago. We have committed ourselves to bring the best digital inking experience 
and the joy of creativity, professionals and enthusiasts around the world. Sneakers, cars, comics, images, and nearly any kind of digital contents has at some point come to life on one of our devices. Wacom's name actually comes from Japanese words for harmony, wa. You can see the kanji here, and from computer. It carries a mission to bring harmony between people and technologies, a mission which we clearly share with Samsung. In today's world, we are blending human and digital interaction in the most natural, intuitive way. Of course, not only for smartphones, but any kind of user interface for computer, tablets, smart boards, fridges, games, TVs, and so many more in the future. Using ink is one of the most joyful and human things people have done in thousands of years. As children, we all use ink intuitively, without any briefing, to express our ideas, our thoughts, and emotions, and our dreams. And in our education, we learn to write an essential and proven brain activities, which enable us to communicate, to memorize, to think and to create, and to express our ideas. But becoming adults, we often lose that feeling in our work life and offices due to some technical limitations and norms. But mind mapping, doodling, and visual creative thinking stay as one of the most powerful tools we human beings have. Still, for our most important, most emotional communication, we tend to use pen and ink, the most humane way to express and document our feelings. And for our most significant and important steps in life, we use our signatures. But to do all this in the digital world, digital ink must fulfill the highest quality level, coming as close as possible to the analog writing experience. With today's Wacom Ink experience, used also in the latest Galaxy Note 9, we are coming so close to what we have delivered to creative professionals. Like no other company, we can bring our development for the best artists, designers, and digital content creators to a partnership with Samsung and you as developers. But digital ink is much more. In the world of augmented reality, 3D creation, and digital data, digital ink will play a fantastic role and is so exciting for you as developers to be able to create completely new experiences. Let me introduce you to Wacom Ink Layer Language, Will 3.0, with a little film. In this film, uh, we try to demonstrate a tangible examples of Wheel 3.0 technologies, offering three-dimensional rendering of ink using the depth perception of AR technology on Note 9. Moreover, Wheel 3.0 is AI-ready by capturing all relevant data needed for deep learning. With this technology, for example, context-related sketch recognition can be implemented, fusing the content detected by the camera with the semantics extracted from the sketching. This enables a new innovative way of human-machine interaction for AR. 
How is this possible? The semantic meaningful ink can be detected by AI technology and linked to ink using Will 3.0. Will 3.0 can capture the relative context of ink. Wherever it's recorded, describing also the environment or situation, like a business meeting, relaxing coffee, architecture environment. Who recorded the ink? You take developed concept in virtual meetings together with your colleagues using the same canvas and identifying every contributor. Even more, your ink carries your emotions and is inhabited in the way you write and scribble. Ink is personal. Wheel 3.0 is able to capture biometric information that makes your ink unique. It's recording the speed and acceleration you write, the angle you hold a pen, and the pressure you apply. With the capabilities using Wacom's universal ink with 3.0, it's a perfect partner to leading technologies and applications from Samsung, flashing Samsung ecosystem to a full extent. Link Samsung's voice assistant with real semantic, biometric, and metadata, you now can just ask, hey, Bixby, show me all the photos I took to build bridges and towers. Hey, Bixby, show me all the notes Nobu has commented on. Bixby, show me all the notes related to Wacom's office in Dusseldorf. Samsung Pass. Samsung Pass is a powerful security service using biometric authentication technology to confirm identity of a person. In the analog world, a signature is a widely accepted way of identification, often used to declare your intent, wedding, contract, payment. Let's combine the most natural and humane experience of inking with digital authentications. Wacom's enhanced signature verification is even able to track the history of signatures because your handwriting is changing over time. Combining biometric signature ID with Samsung Pass second factor, iris scan, face recognition, and fingerprint, it makes it the most powerful and most holistic identification method or simple. Being a natural experience without losing security. I'd like to invite you for real 3D ink demonstrations downstairs and seeing the video and to discover all the possibilities of today's digital ink technology from Wacom at our booth. We are excited to listen to your feedback. Let's develop ink together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please welcome back Yoon Lee. Thank you, Nobu. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, the teams, Wacom, Samsung. They're very exciting. So uh, to build on the excitement, I have in my hand Note 9 with S Pen. And after hearing that the SDK was coming out, at this year's SDC, I jumped on it first, OK? So uh, with click, I'm going to demo with click of a, a button on S Pen. I'm going to take a selfie with you guys. And then I'm going to post it live on Twitter just to let my dad know that I'm actually on stage, OK? So I'm going to tell the staff to shed the light that way. So it's Note 9, double click, and it gives me the uh, selfie mode. Come on, guys, weird action, weird action, all right? OK, so a click of, by the way, if you have Twitter on, it's hashtag SDC18 or Samsung Dev underscore, Samsung underscore Dev, just to let you know this is not a fake, OK? So again, handshake, handshake, all right. One, two, three, cheese. There you go. And then I pre-composed everything on the, Twitter, as you can see right here, and I'm tweeting. There you go. OK. Wow, man, that was cool. SDC 2018 is where now meets next. We've asked ourselves, 
What does the future of tech look like? Heck, what does the future look like, period? Well, that's up to you. It's time to realize those possibilities. It's time to build a future. We can't wait to see what you create. Thanks for joining us. Next start, now. Thank you.